everyone, I'm Carly Vina, and I will be your host for this episode 331 of At Percussion. With me today is my co-host, Ben Charles. Hey, Ben. Hey, Carly. How are you? Good. How's your summer going so far? It's been very slow, which is nice. I think we all need that. <laughs> Hopefully, many of our listeners are also enjoying some slower days and weeks um, with maybe less action packed in. Um, today's episode will be released on June 2nd, and Ben, with our recent um, history of <laughs> uh, music history um, games that we've had with questions and names, I am almost afraid to ask, what happened in music history on June 2nd, Ben? So today is Sir uh, Edward Elgar's birthday. Uh, he was born in 1857. And uh, percussionists are usually familiar with this piece, The Enigma Variations, which actually Carly and I got to perform together, God, probably about 10 years ago with Miami Symphony. Um, and there's that famous timpani excerpt uh, from the Troit mu uh, movement that's supposed to sound like an amateur pianist stumbling across the keys. So I figured for uh, today in Edward Elgar history, you could play uh, Elgar or Nelgar, <laughs> some, uh, some composer facts about Elgar. So as a reminder, as is, as is the trend, all these facts will be real facts about a composer, uh, but not necessarily Elgar. And John, our guest for today, you are welcome to play along with Ed, uh, Elgar or Nelgar. And so uh, our first Elgar or Nelgar fact is that his, uh, his wife's family disowned her for marrying him. I'm going to go with Elgar. John? Uh, <laughs> I read The Grout over 40 years ago. I can't... <laughs> I'll... Elgar. <laughs> that is indeed Elgar. Apparently, his family was, or her, her family was not a fan. Um, the second fact: we're we're all familiar that with Elgar being a lover of of writing letters, and if you know about the Enigma variations, they were all friends of his. Um, so the next one is that Elgar was very into calligraphy. Elgar or Nelgar? I think that's another Elgar. That is a Nelgar, oh, no. but I'm wondering if anyone knows what famous composer was very into calligraphy. Lou Harrison. Lou Harrison, Harrison. was big into I bet I bet there are a lot of composers, especially when everything was like handwritten. True, yeah, yeah. They might have easily been into calligraphy. So we got a, we got two more facts here. Uh, the next one is that Elgar fell madly in love with a young Parisian countess. Sounds tempting. John, what do you think? You go first on this one. I'll say yes, Elgar. <laughs> Carly? I say no, but I don't want to say Nelgar because it sounds silly. <laughs> that is Nelgar. <laughs> that was actually Franz Liszt was the one that fell madly in love with a young Parisian countess. And our last uh, Elgar or Nelgar was that he was self-taught. I don't think so. Are they saying no, John? I think that's actually correct. It is correct. Yeah, so uh, apparently back in the day, it was you know common to go study in Vienna or something like that. But Elgar's family, I guess, didn't have money. So he learned piano, bassoon, and violin all uh, at home hoping to at one time become a concert violinist. And he also taught himself composition by studying scores in the family shop. And uh, with Carly being married to a bassoonist, I can only imagine how wonderful a self-taught bassoonist would sound. <laughs> as soon as you said that, I thought like, I don't think you could pick a harder instrument to self-teach. <laughs> self yeah. mean, although yeah. like it takes years just to learn how to make a read that sounds decent. Yeah, well, apparently he was he was working on that. I don't know how far he got on the bassoon before he switched <laughs> composition. <laughs> Maybe that's why. Well, yeah. that's all. Uh, that's all for Elgar or Nelgar today. <laughs> Thanks for playing, everyone. <laughs> we gotta workshop your names, Ben. I think my favorite was Du Vorjak or Don't Vorjak. <laughs> that was my favorite of yours too, <laughs> but <laughs> that's not saying much. John is like, what did I get myself in? <laughs> We're doing this new thing. <laughs> well, 
Well, I am very happy. Thank you, Ben, I should say. Thank you. Of course. Nelgar or Nelgar. I'm very happy to introduce our guest today, who you have already heard from. This is John R. Beck joining us today. John is a professor of percussion at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, and he also teaches at Wake Forest University. He's the principal percussionist of the Winston-Salem Symphony, is a member of the Greensboro Symphony, Brass Band of Battle Creek, and the Philidor Percussion Group. He was a member of the United States Marine Band and has performed regularly with groups um, in the DC area, National Symphony, Baltimore Symphony, Washington and Baltimore Operas, and the Theater Chamber Players of the Kennedy Center. He has toured the US as a xylophone soloist with the Jack Daniels Silver Cornet Band, Brass Band of Battle Creek, and the New Sousa Band. He is, in addition to all of this, also a past president of the Percussive Arts Society and presents clinics endorsing Yamaha percussion instruments, Zildjian cymbals, innovative mallets, and is a Remo endorsed drum circle facilitator in the health and wellness community. So thank you so much for joining us um, today, John. Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So the main focus of our conversation today is going to be digging into careers and specifically on preparing for career opportunities um, in percussion in, in the future. And you've enjoyed a really well-rounded career, as we just heard about, with a variety of performance opportunities, um, being a university professor, and even getting into drum circle facilitation. Would you tell us about your path on these various endeavors? Sure. Um, you know, what I tell my students and have told my students ever since I taught actually at Shenandoah Conservatory back when it was Shenandoah College in the 1980s is that you need to be prepared for any opportunity. And when the opportunity comes, if you're a good musician and you're prepared for it, you walk through the door and that will lead to another opportunity. Um, I never planned on being a xylophone soloist with a turn of the century brass band touring the country. It was not a career goal. Um, I was in school at a time when percussionists largely were focused on orchestral training and getting a gig in an orchestra. And then Lee Stevens wrote this book, this white book, and all of a sudden people thought, well, maybe I could be a solo person percussionist and Steve Schick had just come on the scene and there were some potential opportunities. Nexus was appearing at uh, the PASIC convention and so there's some other avenues that up, opened up but kind of the conservative path was large ensemble player. Um, I was set to leave my master's degree and go to Midland Odessa, Texas to play in the symphony there and teach in Midland and Odessa about 60 students a week playing once a month regional works for concerts. That was gonna be my first step. And then I won the job in the Marine Band and thought Washington would be a more exciting place. I'll give that a try. Um, and in, when I was in the Marine Band, I had the opportunity to play some solos that went well. And I sort of established myself as a solo player, but it was not something I ever sought it was just an opportunity that led to a whole bunch of other opportunities. Um, all the while I was doing these touring things with the groups, um, I was also doing university teaching. So I've actually been teaching in the college setting on and off since 1985, which is when I was teaching in, in Carly's gig, when it was just an adjunct position. I would drive from Washington head back, do my eight o'clock musters with the Marine Band and, and tried to juggle those two things. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I was kind of living in both worlds, the academic world and the freelance world once I got out of the Marine Band in uh, 87. And so all those things you listed in Washington were things I did as a freelance player, um, besides teaching multiple drum lines, lessons in my basement, sleeping in the car in the parking lot right outside the percussion studio there at Shenandoah so I could get a couple hours before I had to get to the next gig. Um, you know, it was that kind of lifestyle for quite a while. Did that sort of answer your question? <laughs> yeah, well, I have two follow-ups, but I'll ask one for now. So you mentioned you were thinking about going to Texas and then you won the audition with the Marine Band. How much was it on your mind, like the differences in the types of playing you would do in an orchestra versus in a band? 
Well, I had the advantage of being the son of a percussionist who was in the Marine Band during the Eisenhower era. So I had a little bit of inside information that this was not going to be a totally different kind of job than playing in an orchestra. And most of the playing and the training that I had done was exactly like playing in an orchestra. The audition involved excerpts, uh, playing solos and sight reading. The difference in the military was that there was ceremonial duty. Uh, so every Friday in the summer, I was on the parade deck playing bass drum, marching back and forth, uh, doing funerals at Arlington Cemetery. But the concert side of it was really no different than playing in an orchestra. It just happened to be band transcriptions of orchestra literature or band pieces. Um, I had the opportunity when I was in the band to transcribe a, an interview with Charlie Owen, um, who had uh, done this interview, I believe, while he was teaching at the University of Michigan. Um, Charlie had done 20 years in the Marine Band, 20 plus maybe years in the Philadelphia Orchestra. And then the third part of his career was teaching at the University of Michigan. And he answered that question saying, there's no difference between an orchestral drummer and a band drummer. If a drummer knows his stuff, he will survive in either of those um, environments, those ensembles. Um, admittedly now, a drummer knows his stuff is really, a drummer knows their stuff, right? Because <laughs> we're a little broader community than we were. Um, and I, I'll mention that when I was in the Marine Band, there were no women percussionists. Um, there are a few, but it's still an ensemble that was largely an all male ensemble until I believe 1973. So that part of it was very different. It felt a little bit like a fraternity as opposed to an orchestra, which was much more inclusive and diverse at that time. That's something I never thought about. Do you think the, that there were more women in orchestras sooner than in military bands? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah that's not now, but back when I was in, in the early 80s, yeah, I'm, I think there were maybe... 10 to 12 women in the entire band um, mm -hmm. and no women in the percussion section. Yeah, interesting. Um, well, one thing I saw in your in your bio is that you've played with the New Sousa Band and I had an opportunity, there's, there's a conductor, um, he's a band director that I work with in South Florida and he loves Sousa and he's like a Sousa scholar and he's trying to get this kind of professional Sousa band started in Miami and we did some concerts before COVID and, and I think they're still going with concerts now. Um, and I like dipped my toe a little bit in reading about some of the traditions of, you know, the way they would play roles in the Sousa band and, um, you know, the way that, so, so many of these conventions like the bass drum and cymbal player um, knew many things from, that came directly from Sousa that weren't necessarily written in any parts. And so the arrangements are, are tricky sometimes. Um, what was your experience with the Sousa band? I always ask whenever anybody on the show played with, with any Sousa band, um, what, what that's been like. Yeah, um, my participation in the Sousa band came directly from my experience in the Marine band. Uh, Keith Bryan, who started the new Sousa band, a former band director at Yale, um, heard that I did xylophone solo. So he hired me to play NOLA, the Felix Art xylophone solo for a convention of anesthesiologists in Washington, D.C. This was after I was out of the band. That's a weird gig. Um, <laughs> it was an interesting gig. Uh, we were at the convention center playing this kind of period ensemble, New Sousa. I think they also had the opportunity to attend the National Symphony concert. And there was a third event. It was like they could choose their arts activity for the evening. Um, so anyway, I, I met Keith there, things went well, I toured with him. Keith got a lot of his information from Fred Hinger, sometimes known as Dan Hinger. Uh, Hinger had played in the Navy band, and a lot of these traditions were passed down from drummers who had played with Sousa. Um, so the tap five-stroke roll, like at the end of Stars and Stripes, we have 32 bars of five-stroke rolls putting the accent on the upbeat with a single stroke at the beginning of the roll. Supposedly that came from the Sousa drummers through Hinger to Keith Bryan 
And then he insisted all of his snare drummers played with this style. Um, when I was in the Marine Band, they used the same emphasis on the attack of the role rather than the release of the role. But the snare drummers there were playing them as pressed five stroke roles. Um, and it gives the, the well, we're kind of veering way off into music history here, but it gives the march a real uplifted kind of a, a drum set feel in the last 32 bars when the march, when the rolls are accenting the and counts and the bass drum and cymbals are on one and two. So this boom, ba doom, da doom, da doom, da, instead of one, two, one, it helps up, uplift the, the last part of the trio. Uh, so that was my knowledge of that style. Um, Keith played almost exclusively with a bass drummer named Brian Holt. Brian is a member of the Allentown band and um, also an orchestral player. He's an accountant by day trade. Um, and Brian is just an absolute artist on bass drum and cymbals together. Um, just super musical. And the snare drummer Keith would hire most of the time was Dave Myers. Um, the last time I played with them was I think in 2015. Uh, we had a chance to do a, a show in, uh, I'm sorry, New York City. Um, but on and off for almost 20 years, um, I did a bunch of work with Keith and Keith just really dug into the whole history of the way Sousa composed, how he came up with his melodies, that he was a violinist composing band music. Um, it, it's an interesting history. It's all so interesting and I'm glad there are people that, um, I guess that this oral tradition is being passed down because it would be a shame. I mean, things are being changed, you know, like when you listen to the Marine Band recording of certain marches, like like you said, they're playing pressed five stroke rolls instead of that, um, what is it, open five stroke roll with a single at the end? A single at the beginning. A single so at the beginning. Left, left, right, right, left. Right. Bum, drum, drum, drum. I mean, yeah, it's just it's it's fascinating stuff. Um, so I'm I'm glad that I'm glad that we're carrying this forward and that people are still learning the tradition. Within the military bands, even in the same band, march style can change leader to leader. So each conductor has their own preference about the way the marches are interpreted. Um, so we would often change things depending on which conductor was in front of us and what he wanted. And I think that was true with Sousa. From what I understand, the march parts were really like a drum set chart and they were a template, but he would throw accents and ask them to do different things. So the bass drummer or cymbal player where they put those accents could completely change the character of the march. They just had to watch the conductor for those cues. Fred Fennell followed that tradition as well with the Eastman Wind Ensemble. This is, uh, I'm having one of those moments on the podcast where I just have so many things that you said that, that excite me. And like, it's, it's uh, so cool for me because like one of my teachers was Don Bick, who was the timpanist in the president's own. And then also Charlie Owen was my, was my grand teacher because I studied with William Mersh, who studied with him. Um, and I have this great love for Sousa, and he was like a, this really interesting sort of Renaissance man, um, and I could go on and on about that. Um, but I wanted to talk a bit about this xylophone tradition. Um, for any of our listeners that aren't familiar, uh, Joe Green, who was George Hamilton Green's brother, was the xylophone soloist for the Sousa band. Uh, so there's certainly a tradition, a connection between our ragtime xylophone tradition and, and the Sousa band tradition. And much like Carly, I am, um, there was this group called the Florida Wind Ensemble, I think it was, when I was in South Florida. And they did an all Sousa concert with a bunch of, they did the Chike 4 finale, the Sousa arrangement, a bunch of Sousa marches, and they did xylophonia. And I got to be Joe Green for the day and, and play that xylophone part. Um, but uh, that is a pretty simple, straightforward tune to play the, the written out xylophone solo part for. But John, you're talking about this uh, idea of like being a versatile percussionist that can basically, you can say yes to any gig. And um, I'm the one that recently bought the artist special xylophone that you commented on on Facebook. Um, but uh, even though I own an artist special xylophone, if someone called me 
up and said, hey, we're doing a, a Bob Becker concert. We need someone to come play Ragtime Xylophone. I would hang up the phone and <laughs> say, no, I don't feel comfortable with that. So did you have a, um, was this something that you grew up doing or is it something that you quickly figured out? What's, what's your backstory with Ragtime Xylophone playing? And also, I wanted to mention, John recently put a, a new recording up uh, of him playing xylophone. I wish I could remember the name of the tune, but um, I think it was a Deegan 262, a uh, beautiful instrument, and John's the soloist on that recording. Yeah, that was uh, just last week with a brass band at Battle Creek. Uh, I was playing uh, Harry Brewer's Chasing Gary. That's what it was, yeah. No, I'm sorry, not Chasing Gary, uh, Back Talk. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just hired to do a uh, Sousa-style concert in next April, and Chase and Gary is going to be the encore. That's why that's at the top of my brain. Gotcha. Um, so uh, a little of the history of the, the xylophone with the Sousa band and kind of the metamorphosis. Um, back when Joe Green was playing with the Sousa band, he was playing largely transcriptions of standard orchestra music, of solos. Um, they were not playing ragtime with Sousa. Although Sousa later towards the end of his career did have a drum set in the band. You, you can actually see that drum set at the uh, Company of Fifers and Drummers Museum in Iverton, Connecticut, uh, which is pretty cool to see Sousa's drum set. Um, but the, the xylophone solos were played, uh, there were orchestra transcriptions or solo transcriptions of classic tunes just because the xylophone could be heard without amplification. Um, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, in the military bands, xylophone fell out of favor for the marimba. Um, Creston Marimba Concerto had been written, Charlie Owen played at Philadelphia. Um, so when I got in the band in the early 80s, everything was a marimba solo, not a xylophone solo. But Nexus had just released their ragtime recording, the direct to disc recording, and everyone wanted to be Nexus, who was a student in the late. 70s, early 80s. I mean, they were our, our percussion idols. So we were all learning ragtime solos to play at the end of our recitals. I had a bunch of those under my hands. So I suggested trying some novelty tunes with the Marine Band. And because that was a new thing, even though it was old, um, they went with it. So that's how I became known as a xylophone soloist. My first uh, keyboard solo with the band was an arrangement of the Liszt Hungarian Rhapsody that uh, Don Hunsberger, the conductor of the Eastman Wind Ensemble, had done for my father in the 1950s when he was in the band. So I played the Hungarian Rhapsody and my encore was Jason Gary, but on marimba, not xylophone. Um, that, that's kind of how I shifted things to novelty xylophone solo playing with band, but that was not a thing when I was in the band. It was playing classical transcriptions like the List Hungarian Rhapsody as a solo piece or Chartus or something like that. Gotcha. So mostly violin music, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I mean, anything for solo, um, solo instrumentalist could be transferred over to keyboard percussion. And then I was going to mention one other thing. It's interesting. We, you talked about uh, the, what was the bass drummer's name that you mentioned? Uh, Brian Holt. Yeah, and I know that Sousa was very particular about bass drum players, and it, don't quote me on this, this is my understanding, but I heard that at one point Sousa fired his entire band except for the bass drum player. I don't know that story, but I do know that Gus Helmucky, his bass drum player, was the highest paid member of the band. He relied on that position <laughs> so, so, so much. And he understood the importance of a bass drummer being able to carry a band or destroy a band. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, it's something I, I talk to band directors a lot about, like you think you can put the less capable student or less experienced student on bass drum, but- gosh. The Caleb Pickering, yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Caleb's gonna come after you. <laughs> But yeah, they, like they're in the driver's seat and you can really get in trouble if, if you're not careful with that. When I was doing a lot of drumline uh, coaching in Northern Virginia after I left the band, I was always pushing band directors to put their more talented students on, on the bass drum parts, not the snare drum parts. I know they all wanted to play the cool licks on snare drum, but if the bass drum line isn't happening, the band is not going to sound good. <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I, we're talking about career paths and um, I'm, I'm wondering, John, did you have moments of uncertainty or doubts about your path as you moved through your career in different stages? Um, and maybe what advice do you have for our listeners who might be unsure of where their path is headed? All right, it's funny that you should ask that. I'm in the process of doing a bunch of spring cleaning and I just, just discovered the stack of rejection letters from orchestra auditions that I saved every one of them. It's about this thick. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I was gonna say one of my favorite podcast stories was Chris Deveni when he worked at Steve Weiss, I guess every single time he got uh, rejected from an orchestra audition, Steve would write on the wall, Chris's failed auditions or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, that's a, a tough path. And to, to be lucky enough to be the person who plays well enough that day that the committee likes um, and not get really dejected and thinking you're a failure. Because any one of a dozen people could probably do the job really well, but they're going to choose one and it's completely out of your control. Um, so I, that was kind of the, the path I was headed down was um, orchestral auditions and just applying to every audition I could could do, um, teaching on the side, you know, to make a living so I could pay the rent. Um, my path in orchestra playing kind of changed when I was offered a position with the Jack Daniels Silver Cornet Band. And that was completely by reference. Um, at the time, my wife was living in Naples, Florida, playing viola in the Naples Philharmonic. And the flute player in that orchestra was married to the tuba player in the Dallas Brass. And he knew a bunch of the guys in the Jack Daniels Band. They had just let their mallet player go. They were looking for somebody on a tour so I got a call and my audition was a two week tour, um, playing NOLA every night and plus the, the mallet. Um, but that allowed me to not have to be wedded to gigs in Washington, but I could move to Florida and do this road work. So I did that pretty regularly for about three or four years. I was on the road 20 to 25 weeks a year, but living in Florida was great. <laughs> Um, so that was an opportunity that I didn't really see coming, but because I'd done the work in the Marine Band, I was able to accept the gig. Um, and this is when community concert series were kind of a viable career option. That, that circuit doesn't really exist anymore, and the money to pay a 13-piece ensemble to play in each town, that, that just doesn't exist in 2022. Um, so I'm not suggesting that's a good career path, um, but I kind of, I didn't quit doing the orchestra auditions. I just had this other opportunity. So when I had all these rejection letters, it's like, all right, well, I'll try this for a while. It seems like a, a, a nice way to make money and I don't have to keep going to auditions and leaving with everybody else to go to the bar because we all didn't make the finals. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the, the orchestra path. Um, so you were asking about advice for people. Yeah, for any of our listeners that might be at, you know, one of these turning points of, well, what am I going to do? Yeah. Um, my advice when I started teaching at the School of the Arts in 1998 and my advice today in 2022 is a little bit different because the whole world has changed, not just because of the pandemic, that just kind of lit a match and accelerated the change in the arts. Um, so my advice to people, students now, is that you don't have to follow my path. You don't have to follow the path of anybody. You need to chart your own path because all the, the conventions that we thought existed as performing musicians, teaching musicians, it's all been dumped on the floor. And in order to figure out who you are as a musician, you need to follow your passion, but reinvent what it means to be a performing musician. And that may be some performing, some teaching, some music in healthcare, some doing stuff that's not music. And there's no shame in putting together that kind of a career. 
Um, you know, when I was in school, if you didn't get an orchestra gig, you were a failure. That was kind of the mindset. Um, or I went all the way through school, got my doctorate. Now I'm applying for teaching gigs and I'm not getting to the finals of any of these teaching gigs. I'm a failure as a college teacher. I mean, it's a tough business and there are way too many people for the jobs that are available. But I think the successful people are going to be the ones who don't take that as rejection, but use that as motivation to say, these are the things I'm passionate about. And these are the things that I can put together to make my own path and reinvent what it means to be a musician in 2022 or 2030. Um, none of us have the answer. And anybody that tells you that I can get you a job if you come study with me that's going to be there in 2050 is not telling the truth because none of us have the answers anymore. You know, the pandemic totally upended everything. That's a, a scary thing to think about, but it's also an amazing opportunity for people to reinvent the business. Yeah, and I think in some ways that reinvention is um, overdue. You know, I, I love what you said about don't be ashamed about having a different path or, you know, um, even I think to, we're talking about or orchestra versus band playing. I think there were people, there are probably people today, but probably people 20, 30 years ago that thought like a oh, band isn't as high, you know, as classy a, a job as playing in an orchestra, you know, like the orchestra is the pinnacle. Um, and we see kind of uh, like holdover of that too in a lot of school school groups where like the orchestra is the highest group to audition into and the wind ensemble is the second, um, which is a, a whole other thing. But I think, I think it's so important what you said, like don't feel ashamed of the path that you have if it doesn't look like your teachers or your friends or your colleague or anybody else's because we have to find our own voice. Um, and even, even more important maybe is that it needs to be, what, what we're doing, our output as a musician needs to be authentic. Like we need to find those things that, that resonate with us the most. And that's gonna be the path that's gonna be, um, of course, artistically fulfilling, but, but probably the, the most viable financially fulfilling path too, because it's going to be true and it's going to be inspired um, and all of that. Ben just reminded me here in the chat too about um, a story that when I was in Boston studying with Nancy Zeltzman, she, um, I, I imagine she does this every couple of years, but would do kind of a career talk and she would tell us about her, her years when she finished school and she's, you know, forging this path of I want to play marimba, I'm going to make a living playing marimba. Um, and she, she, you know, she had the duo marimba Lynn and all of that. And she, she told us about how she worked full time in a health food store. Um, and that, that was the best thing for her because she could work 40 hours a week in the store and then practice the rest of the day. She had nights and weekends for practicing and performing. And that's when Marimelin built, you know, a lot of their repertoire. And um, she was able to accomplish so much in that time. And of course, nobody's goal finishing college is I want to work in a grocery store. Um, and, and there were people in the class that did not want to hear that, but, uh, you know, that's what allowed her to, to have the career that she has. And she was just inducted into the PAS Hall of Fame, which is huge. Um, yeah, she charted her own path. And there were, there were a few people doing that, but the way she chose to mold her career and do the music she loved and work with the composers that she worked with, the commission, um, she, she did follow her heart, you know? <laughs> and found a way to make it work. Um, and I'm She's sure- done all right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for, I, I imagine there were people that told her, you can't, you know, we've had other guests on the show talk about how to forge a career in marimba specifically, but probably there's always gonna be people that say you can't make a living playing the marimba or teaching the marimba if that's all you focus on, but um, you can, yeah. I mean, I think with any, any career in the arts, you have to be, really fortunate with the connections you make and really savvy and there's a lot of factors but of course absolutely you can. Carly it also reminds me to a certain extent I think you you sort of relayed this to me from Nancy Zeltzman but it was something along the lines of like you you don't play marimba you don't become an artist to make money like that's a nice like side benefit of it and of course we love to like support ourselves and it like brings me back way back to I this must have been like episode 18 or something of the podcast we had Mark Applebaum and he talked about his Taco Bell plan 
And he said that he realized at a certain point he would be completely happy working at Taco Bell to support himself and just doing whatever he wanted with composition. Uh, and obviously it's, he doesn't work at Taco Bell. He's gotten the gig at Stanford, which is not a bad job, but yeah, it's like the whole idea of you have to financially support yourself and you also have to have an artistic output and hopefully one day those things meet eye to eye, but it's not necessarily guaranteed, especially at a young age. And one of the things I, I tell students, um, especially with where my career has gone the last seven years with the music and healthcare component, um, is that you know I can present a recital and I can play, you mentioned Zanakis, I could play Safa, I could maybe attempt to play Merlin or, or something in the Schwatner of Velocities, but nobody's going to pay to hear me play that if they don't know me. But if I've made a connection with these people through a drum circle, and now we have a, a personal relationship, maybe they'll come check out my, my recital where I'm doing music that might be a little edgy or avant-garde. But if I just am presenting that kind of music, I'm going to pretty much limit my audience to an academic audience or a PAS audience. So we've got a, what, a community of 5,000 people who come to PASIC. That's not a very big audience <laughs> in the large scheme of things. But if I've made a connection with people playing music in other ways, then when I invite them to come to my recital, they might check me out and they might really dig what I'm doing. Um, so you know, doing other things musically is kind of a marketing tool. And it's also a way to make some extra bread. It might not be playing the most edgy new music on stage, but it's a way to stay in music and be relevant and make connections. Um, then there's, we can get into the whole internet marketing. You know, Casey is a genius at that. <laughs> um, there's, you know, there's a whole hierarchy of people who have grown up in social media and use that tool really well. And people like me who had to write term papers on typewriters with whiteout, <laughs> just trying to stay up with a curve of email, right? <laughs> Um, you know, so that whole being able to record yourself and put out a digital product that's enticing and will get people to come check you out live, that, that's a whole another avenue of discussion. Well, that, that leads me perfectly to the next question I wanted to ask you, which is, what, what do you think are some of the skills that are advantageous for young people to be developing to help them be prepared for these opportunities um, of the future? The recording piece is essential. I mean, if you back up a step, you have to be able to play well. You have to have studied your craft well enough to play acoustically well. And then the next piece is you have to be savvy enough or know the right people to be able to give you a video and audio presence that you can use as a marketing tool and then be able to use it strategically so you're not overusing the marketing. Um, you're teasing with the marketing rather than flooding the internet. And I think that may be where we kind of are post pandemic um, is everybody was putting out digital content for free. We're all trying to reach people and just giving away our content. And now that's an expectation that I can get it for free. Why would I pay, come to, hear, pay to come hear you at a concert? or pay to come to hear the symphony, you just presented two years of concerts free online. Um, that, that's a whole nother kind of topic, um, but the ability to be able to present yourself in a digital format and ideally be able to do that yourself so you can help others do it and make some bread. Um, as a recording engineer, as a videographer, um, I think that's a skill that now is really an essential tool for every musician. And there's and, a lot of garbage on the internet done in bedrooms, right? <laughs> of yellow after the rain recordings <laughs> that we probably don't want out there if you want to try to market yourself as a professional musician. John, I was going to ask one thing we've talked about several times. There's always these discussions that come up of like, do we really need to be talking about uh, 12 tone rows in music theory class? Wouldn't it be more productive to have a, a class on recording in college curriculums, these sorts of things? 
Um, and I don't, I don't wish to get into the debate right now, but do you think these, uh, for example, recording skills, is that something that people should be seeking out a course for, or is that more of a process of self-discovery? Or, I mean, I don't think it has to be one or the other, but what's been your experience with students and, and getting there, so to speak? I'm finding my students, for the most part, are coming to school with some of that skill already. Uh, I just had a high a, the school of the arts pro program is high school through graduate school. So I have 16 year olds and you know, 22, 23 year olds in the same studio. Um, I just had a high school senior graduate who became our recording engineer. He loved that end of the business. He was good at it, um, completely self-taught. Um, so I think a lot of students are coming with that knowledge, but I think it's incumbent on schools to provide that at the freshman year and give the students a four-year laboratory if they're not proficient to become proficient at that because uh, I think it's just an essential piece of what we need to do as performers is be able to put out digital content that's really high quality. Um, the School of the Arts right now is going through a, a major curriculum revision. We were established in the 1960s under the kind of Juilliard Curtis model of an orchestral training school, very much a 19th century curriculum of studying with the master teacher, orchestra focused. Um, and that's just not where students need to be right now. They need all these other schools on skills that you mentioned. Um, so we're completely upending the curriculum and talking about establishing minors. Um, my job, at the school because I've had my feet in healthcare for the next, for the last seven years is really beginning to focus on how can we teach students to be good citizen artists who are thinking beyond the concert stage, but taking their music to the community in different ways, performing with people, not just for people. Um, so I, I see a real shift in kind of where my skill set is going as opposed to just teaching paradiddles and good two mallet and four mallet technique on marimba. Um, that's all important stuff, but there's all this other stuff that students need to, to know. Um, so my hope is that whoever the next percussion teacher is at the School of the Arts, whenever that person gets there, they will come in with a completely different skill set than I have or my predecessor had. Um, the, the new percussion teacher at Oberlin um, is a filmmaker and a percussionist, and he's coming at this from a totally different direction, which I think is really cool and a very inspired hire. Um, Mike Rosen, my teacher, was a fantastic pedagogue for 50 years. He taught wonderfully at the school, but they hired somebody who was completely different, even though he's an Oberlin grad. Where he's coming from, I think he's very forward looking. Um, that kind of went a different direction, maybe, than your question. No, it's great. You know, um, forward thinking is a, a word, a term I find myself using a lot, too, just thinking about what do students need. And of course, I agree, they need recording skills. They need, uh, you know, at least some basic facility with online marketing and just getting materials out there. Um, and I, I find there's a spread. I don't know what your experience has been, but um, some students come in, like you said, and they're really good with these things. They've kind of grown up with social media and they know how to make things look good and they kind of understand the, the culture of what will get views or what will get likes or you know what will um, go farther and be effective. And then I find there are some that um, haven't developed those skills yet. So it's it's interesting. I think I think we don't have a formal course like for non, um, we, have a, we have a degree plan like music production and recording technology, but for non MPRT majors, to get these basic recording skills, I'm finding it's something we have to cover in within the percussion studio, with you know, with regards to to performance videos, that sort of thing. Which takes away from your ability to teach them all these essential skills they need on snare drum, timpani, and keyboard percussion. Sure, it's always the balance, but it's important. I mean, they they need it, and if they don't get it when they're in school, at some point they're going to have to, you know learn from friends or take a formal course or, or get it later. Um, my graduate student this last year, 
Um, he and I had the opportunity to help out the School of Dance. They lost their West African drumming accompanists. Um, and he was in the middle of his pedagogy class. I said, well, this isn't really percussion pedagogy, but it kind of is. Let's go help out the dance teacher and learn what you need to do to be a dance accompanist, because this is definitely a skill that can earn you some money. Um, so I got there when I could. He did it most of the time, um, just became dance accompanist for the latter half of the semester. For him, that's turned into a summer job opportunity with the teacher's dance troupe over in Durham. And likely he's going to get hired back next year as a dance accompanist at the school. So, I mean, that's not traditional studio percussion teaching, but it was an opportunity. And I think a very good opportunity and a marketable opportunity. Um, I have a course on um, in the course catalog, which is specifically for dance accompany. And I have another one. It's a um, internship in the marching arts to learn how to be a drumline instructor. I mean, we don't have a drum line at school. We don't have a marching band or a football team at this school. Um, but that's a skill I had to learn by the seat of my pants when I left the Marine Band and I needed to make money being a drum line instructor. I never came through DCI. Um, most of my students now have that high school marching band experience of competitive drum line. Uh, back in the 70s, when DCI was brand new, a lot of schools were still just marching football games with no competition, which is the program I came from. I mean, spats, a snare drum, a tenor drum, and one bass drum was my marching band. <laughs> so I had to learn a lot very quickly to become a drumline instructor in the mid 80s. Um, so that, that, an, that's another career opportunity. Yeah, between the dance accompaniment and teaching drumline, there, there's so many things that we learn, like you said, either by the seat of your pants, you're, you're learning it as you do it when you get an opportunity or like you get it from having that experience in school. Um, so I think that's a, a great use of pedagogy class time. <laughs> Otherwise, when are you gonna do it? When are you gonna be able to go and say, I haven't done this before, but I wanna learn how. Right, I mean, you wanna be able to say yes to every opportunity and have enough skill in the bank that you can quickly get yourself up to speed instead of zero experience. And then maybe that's your one and only job <laughs> because you get fired. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I wanted to ask you um, because I, I've seen and heard about this work that you've done um, with drum circle facilitation and in the healthcare field. How did you get involved with this? Is this something you kind of um, developed an interest for or you know, just kind of, how, how did you get into it? It was largely through PAS. Um, when I became an officer of PAS, um, each officer has certain job duties. One of the officer positions is in charge of the 17 standing committees. One's in charge of all the state chapters. So I got to know the interactive drumming uh, committee through that uh, being a liaison to the executive committee. And then when I became president, I had a breakfast meeting with the health and wellness committee chair and the drum circle committee chair, the interactive drumming, because they were the two things I knew the least about um, being an orchestrally trained player. They, they were kind of the groups that if you've been to PASIC, uh, for those who have been, um, you know, they're setting up flash jams in the hallway that you're trying to navigate around. It's like, who are these people? It's, what is this world? It's not serious percussion. Um, so I, I met with those, those two committees and the chair of the interactive committee said, John, drum circles are the gateway drug to percussion. If you can hook somebody in a drum circle to understanding how much fun it is to make music together, to, to be in rhythm together, you can then open the door to all this other really cool stuff that we can do. Um, so if if you've been to uh, the Rhythm Discovery Center in Indianapolis, you know that the end of that music museum experience is walking through a drum circle. You can't get out of the building unless you go through the drum circle. And the idea is to encourage people to play. Uh, so I started taking those drums to the um, Children's Hospital in Indiana as a community outreach when I was president. Met music therapists there. They said, you should try this at home. I got back to Winston-Salem and discovered there were no board certified music therapists 
at the medical center, but they had a volunteer program. So I started bringing drums uh, to do, do some volunteer work with a group called Arts for Life. Um, and I found it extremely rewarding drumming with kids who were in the hospital, but that kind of branched out into drumming in senior centers, um, drumming in memory care. Um, one thing led to another and I eventually wound up doing a research study. The impetus for that was really my experience as president of PAS, not knowing who these drum circle guys and girls were, these facilitators, getting a little glimpse into the incredibly valuable work they do, but understanding that most of the percussion community thinks they're not serious. It's not real drumming, but there's really wonderful stuff that's happening. I wanted to put kind of some science behind it. So I started to look into the research behind what it is that makes a drum circle valuable to a non-percussionist. What's happening to create that sense of community? Um, so that's how I got involved in the research and kind of justifying <laughs> or legitimizing, you know, what this drum circle thing is. The pandemic came along, can't do any drum circles in person. Post pandemic, or we're not post right now, we're getting better at managing <laughs> the pandemic. But we have, I think, a new generation of really troubled students who have gone through a traumatic experience. They've not been able to be together in community. They've been virtual. This is an amazing opportunity for drum circle facilitators to help bring people together and to help heal really hurt people. Um, people that don't even know how damaged they are from the experience of being in isolation for two years. Um, just being together in music for 30 minutes smiling at somebody across the drum circle is something we've lost. Um, so I, I, I find that a very rewarding thing to be a part of. You know, hearing you talk about this brings up a few things in my mind, one of which is that um, when Remo Bailey passed away, the founder of Remo, the drumhead company, one of the things people said about him is people would ask, uh, who are your customers? Who do you, who do you want to be your, your clients, so to speak? And his answer was everyone. And I thought like that was such a, a nice like approach to it. And I actually, a uh, week and a half ago, I had a, a, a discussion with my co uh, choir director colleague. And he said that choir singing by default is an amateur activity. And I had never really thought about it like that. And so, and he explained, you know, like there's not too many people that get paid professionally to sing in a choir, much less full time. It's something that you gather and do as a community, whether it's in, church or somewhere else. Um, but then that kind of got me thinking, I was like, well, I guess like drumming is also like the drum circle thing is like the the drumming equivalent of that. It's a community activity. And like with choral activities, I mean, you have people that are virtuoso opera singers that are singing on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera and that's fantastic. But then there's also people that sing together in church choir and form a community that way. And I think we like to think of ourselves as these percussionist superheroes that are playing the the latest, greatest, you know, most difficult marimba soul or something like that. But I think, you know, it's like there is this validity to bringing people together as a community also. So I appreciate that aspect of what you're doing. Yeah, um, Remo's vision was a drum in every household. Yeah. Use it for self-care, to use it for entertainment, enjoyment. Um, his wife was in the medical uh, profession. Um, so she was definitely a partner in his awareness of how powerful playing a drum could be, and especially playing a drum with others, being together in rhythm. Other cultures have been doing this for hundreds of years, but we've lost our ability, particularly in the United States, to come together except in things like church choir, um, where we're actually making music together. And it's okay if it's not great. The act of being together in music is really powerful. Um, and the, the drum circle is our tool to do that. I or even something like the like Steve Reich's drumming is not a, a virtuoso percussion piece. I mean, you could have a, a group of not very talented percussionists that can still play Steve Reich's drumming. And uh, the Steve Schick book talks about that. And I think the, the final words of that book are something like, and so we end together and talking about the same idea. Um, I, 
to share this story, uh, two weeks ago, I did a, a 20 minute icebreaker activity for a, a leadership meeting in Winston-Salem. It was people from all different walks of life that were going through this leadership program and it was arts night. So I brought a bunch of Tubanos. We all played for 20 minutes. We did some call and response and the superintendent of schools happened to be there. And she grabbed me at the end and said, this was really cool. I want you to talk to our arts administrator who actually happened to be my daughter's middle school band director, but that's a different subject. Um, so anyway, through an email exchange, she copied a bunch of people in and said, the drumming was so powerful. I would like to see this in all of our schools next year. Please set up a meeting. She understood that what we were doing could solve, it's not just a music issue, it's you know, kids in crisis, conflict resolution, isolated kids, uh, behavioral issues. It's a really powerful tool if used correctly to help people deal with the stress that they're feeling right now. It just sounds so powerful. And it, it, this is making me think back to earlier in the conversation too, where you said like, you don't need to feel shame for not following an orchestral path or something like this is really valuable really powerful really meaningful um and it can be i mean of course it can be music therapy can be in a, a person's entire focus and entire career but it can also be a slice of what you do as a musician yeah, i i was doing a head start music program through the greensboro symphony so my tuesdays this last year were going and seeing a bunch of four-year-olds and doing Head Start music, then going to teach and teaching the, at the university level. And then on symphony weeks, woodshedding so I could play the parts. And that balance of those three things is incredibly rewarding. I don't have to do any one of them exclusively. They're all fitting together. And honestly, drumming with the four-year-olds was the best part of the day because there's no judgment whatsoever. They're just enjoying music. <laughs> I think it's what I like most about percussion is the variety that there's even even in what I'm doing now, which is um, some orchestral playing, but much more solo and chamber playing and teaching at the university level. Everything every day is different. Every focus is different. If I get bored with one one area, there's so much else to explore always. And we're lucky as percussionists in that we are largely a part of every musical genre in some form. We can be. Um, so there's there's variety built right into our performance activities from the very beginning, which in itself is extremely rewarding. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. So I, I have um, one more big question for you. Here's the question. What do you think is a successful career in music? A successful career is a career where you've touched lives with your activity, whether that's as a teacher inspiring students, whether that's as a performer playing for or with people. Um, most teachers, when they retire, have, you know, lots of alumni get together and they, they write responses. But I think as, as, as teachers and performers, we have the ability to affect people's lives and whatever level that is whether it's playing with the new york philharmonic or regional orchestra or a community orchestra people are coming to hear you play and you're affecting their lives so that's successful it, the I, money is a separate issue <laughs> uh, i was gonna i was gonna follow that up i like what you said i think it's so perfect and uh uh, a very dear friend of mine, his father was a band director in, in Illinois for, I don't know how many years, but um, I loved, and his, uh, and his father passed away in 2019, uh, very suddenly and tragically, but I loved one line in particular of his obituary that I wanted to share. It's, while Tom took great pride in the fact that so many of his students became musicians and music teachers, he was just as proud of those that learned to love music for life, no matter their occupation, which I think is like the best tribute you could have to a band director. Um, and on that note, John, I wanted to, in closing, uh, mention one thing and thank you for it. 
Um, Christopher Dean uh, passed away last year in 2021. And uh, I was so happy to see that the UNC School of the Arts Percussion Studio now bears the name of the J. Massey Johnson and Christopher Dean uh, Percussion Studio. And so we actually just completed two big Christopher Dean tribute episodes. Um, and he was a, a wonderful, humble person. Um, but the name J. Massey Johnson, I think, is a lot less familiar to many people. Um, and Christopher Dean's Morning Dove Sonnet was uh, dedicated to J. Massey Johnson, so some people might know that name from there. But could you tell us a little bit about who J. Massey Johnson was and what his influence was? Sure. Um, Massey, as he was known, uh, was the founding teacher at the School of the Arts. The School of the Arts uh, was started in 1965. He was playing timpani in the St. Louis Symphony. And I believe he was at that point also playing at Brevard in the summers. Um, so he applied for the teaching job at this brand new conservatory that was being state funded. So the School of the Arts is the first state funded arts conservatory in the country. And he started the program um, literally in an old high school building. Everything was inside one building. It was not being used anymore. Um, so his studio, the studio that has his name with Chris's name is the old band room of the, the high school. Um, when Massey taught there, there were risers in the band room. Uh, now it's just a flat space. Um, but Chris is arguably his most influential student who came through the program. There were lots of wonderful people who studied with Massey and have gone on to do great things in music. Um, but it just seemed appropriate on Chris's passing that he and the teacher he so admired both should be recognized in the teaching studio um, because a tremendous amount of music education happened in that building, in that room. Um, so I'm hopeful that that plaque will stay on the door in perpetuity. Uh, Chris was also a colleague of mine in the Greensboro Symphony um, and the Philidor Percussion Group before he moved to North Texas. Uh, so I had a chance to, the pleasure of working with him for several years before he moved. Wonderful human being. Yeah, and uh, I just, at the uh, Christopher Dean Memorial Concert at UNT, I, I just remembered they had a video from you speaking a bit, so that was lovely as well. But yeah, it's, it's, so, it's so special to have, I think, a person's name, whether you knew that person or not, uh, on a building and for students to understand the, the sort of importance of that, that legacy and that when they enter this room, uh, it's not just a room, it's more than that. So, yeah. We, we as former students of teachers all have that connection to the teaching studio where we did so much developing. Um, and I, I just wanna make sure students understood the lineage and the heritage of that room. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's been a pleasure to chat with you and we look forward to seeing you all on episode 332. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you so much.